Okay. Uh, this afternoon's session is Partnerships for Climate Action. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Lucia Gamara to the stage, who is Senior Partnerships and Impact Officer with the AWP, who's, who, excuse me, Rumble and Coconut, who will moder moderate this session. Thank you. They're very yummy, those chocolate balls. Did anyone else get one? They slightly stick in the throat, though. Thank you, Tamerlane, and thank you everyone for staying. If I could uh, please ask the panelists today to come at the table, and if I could ask Tom to show our virtual panelists. Nice. Great. Well, thank you everyone again for staying this long. It's great to have you here and thanks to Clem for welcoming us to country yesterday. I'm not from this place, I'm not from this land, but I guess I can say and can acknowledge that always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, it's AWP's pleasure to host all of you here and the diversity of perspectives and experiences because they shape the work that we do in development, in the development sector. Um, the topic of this session of the workshop and of AWP, as you might have noticed, is partnerships. Partnerships are critical to solve complex problems. Um, we'll focus on how our partners who are rising to the existential crisis of climate change are approaching partnering with other organizations and other individuals. Um, they will tell us how they generate action at the rate, scale, and depth needed to avoid catastrophic futures. No pressure. Um, our speakers have a deep level of care, a great sense of urgency, experience, and understanding in climate change impacts in their area of influence. And most importantly, they're taking action to address climate change. So before going any further, um, we'll go over to our speakers to tell us more, a bit more about themselves. Uh, so I'll start with Alison, who's joining us online. Alison, if you could tell us who you are, where you work, and what you do. Sure. Um, thank you so much, Lucia. And it's a, it's a pleasure to, to be here joining you all today. Um, my name is Alice Mocho. I'm a Principal Water Security Specialist with the Asian Development Bank. And I am the partnerships focal uh, for the water team. So for those of you who aren't familiar with um, the Asian Development Bank or ADB, we're an international financial institution, which is headquartered in uh, Manila, Philippines. Um, we've been around since 1966, and we have about 68 member countries, including 49 from here in Asia and the Pacific, including Australia. And we also have 19 member countries from outside the region and uh, in North America and Europe. Um, so as an international financial institution, ADB provides concessional grants and loans. We provide technical assistance and increasingly important, we're providing knowledge and advisory services, including capacity building to our, our member countries. Maybe just very quickly, because the theme um, of this uh, session is on partnerships for tackling climate change. I also wanted to note that ADB has recently also significantly upped our ambitions on climate change um, as part of our efforts to sort of be the, the climate bank for Asia. So uh, we've also recently announced our ambition um, to mobilize around 100 uh, billion in climate financing uh, from our own resources by, by 2030. And I also want to mention that um, we've also committed to full Paris alignment uh, of our sovereign operations by July this year and uh, full alignment of our non-sovereign or private sector operations by July 2025. So hopefully that's just a um, brief introduction to ADB um, and, and what, we, what we do, but I can go into more in detail uh, later in the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alison. It seems like you are ticking all the boxes of the Global Accelerator Framework. Um, now over to Arun. Arun, who you are, where you work, and what you do. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, very nice to be with you, although not physically. 
Uh, and thanks for including me, including me in this panel. I'm Arun Srista, and I am with International Center for Integrated uh, uh, Mountain Development, EC Mode. Uh, many of you might not know uh, EC Mode uh, that well. Uh, EC Mode is an intergovernmental international organization working in this region called Hindu Kush Himalaya, the region that represents the highest mountain uh, in the world. And our member countries include the countries sharing Hindu Kush Himalaya, and they are Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, China, India, Myanmar, Nepal, and Pakistan. Uh, you may know this region is quite vulnerable to climate change, uh, but also the capacity in the region to you know, face the changes, the rapid changes are also quite low. So climate action is very, very important for us. And that's uh, an area where we are really, really engaged in. Uh, I personally am, uh, in terms of background, uh, engineer, um, you know, hydraulic structure, but then uh, my PhD was on climate sciences, was looking at uh, physical and chemical aspects of climate. Currently at EC Mode, I uh, lead a strategic group called Reducing Environmental and Climate Risks. And this uh, strategic group deals with you know, interventions related to cryosphere change, glacier, snow cover, and permafrost, disaster risk reduction, uh, river basin management and uh, reducing air pollution uh, in terms of crash pit change adaptation measures such as early warning flood protection, uh, community-based preparedness, DRR, uh, uh, disaster risk reduction, early warning system, community preparedness, uh, river basin management, you know, bringing together countries to work on common issues in, in the river basin. And we are working with the uh, Australian Water Partnership on this area. And one important area which is very, uh, you know, uh, challenging is air pollution. And uh, reducing air pollution is another area where this strategic group works on. So as you can see, you know, uh, climate action is very important in all those four areas that my uh, strategy group uh, is working on and partnership as well. So that is uh, for a brief introduction about myself and my organization and what we do and look forward uh, to more engaged discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arun. It's great to know that the water towers of Asia are in good hands. Um, now we'll pass over to our physical Panelist, uh, please, Ashley, if you tell us who you are, where you work, and what you do. Yeah, so uh, my name is Ashley Kingsborough. I work at the Department for Environment and Water here in South Australia. Um, I manage a water security team here. So that predominantly is looking at uh, how we do long term planning um, in response to climate change, uh, that we can ensure uh, that we have water, water secure water supplies into the future. Thank you so much, Ashley. Very important labor here in South Australia. Thank you for having us. Um, now over to Clem. No worries. Uh, yeah, so Namani. Namani. Well done. Marnie Nabudni. So it's good that you're all here. Um, for the majority of you would have heard me introduce and talk about myself a lot yesterday. <laughs> um, for those who weren't here, my name's Clem Newchurch. I'm a Ghana man um, residing on uh, Ghana country here in South Australia. Uh, I'm also Narunga and Gugatha. Um, yeah, uh, I work in um, an advisory kind of capacity uh, when dealing with, I guess, um, Ghana cultural heritage issues. Uh, one of the main groups that I'm involved in is uh, Wobbly Kamanka, which is a environmental a Ghana environmental focused advisory group um, that operates through Green Adelaide. So I'll talk a little bit more about that when we're talking about partnerships. But yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Thank Wonderful, Glenn. Thank you. And very generous of you to be sharing your knowledge. Over to Kaneka, please. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Kanika and it's my privilege to be here, and I'm very pleased to be sitting in the panel with Clem. Yesterday, we heard a lot of good story from him. So I'm working with Oxfam, and 
in Mekong Water Governance Program, and I manage the inclusion project we call Strengthening Civil Society and Inclusion uh, Civil Society in Water Governance Program. Uh, you may question in terms of what is inclusion about. So we this is a project funded uh, by DFAT, and we are now implementing the second phase of the inclusion project, and we're also happy to have over new funded partner like SDC, the Swiss Agency for Development, also support as a co-investment between DFAT and SDC. And the project is really looking at how we can build the voice of community who often unheard and who often not in the table when it's come to water discussion or when we're talking about water diplomacy, when we're talking about transboundary water sharing. But those people who are at the front line, riverian community, community who are suffer from that change of the climate in the Mekong region. And I don't want to touch more on the touch of the Mekong because you heard from Dr. Anula yesterday how the Mekong look like and what are the context is. So our work is trying to bring the diverse boy and the different group and it, no matter their social status it is, but we believe that they also have right to be there and be in the table and bring their voice uh, to be heard and be able to have an equitable and equal the share of those border benefits. So maybe I will touch a little bit in terms of how we work in the partnership with those diverse groups in the next question. Thank you so much, Kinnick. I'm sure we'll all be interested to know how you approach inclusion after the lively discussion we had in the training on Tuesday. Last but not least, Seth. Yes, hello everyone. I'm, I'm um, Seth Westra. Uh, I'm an academic at the University of Adelaide. Uh, my office is literally just on the other side of the road there. So very, very uh, good to commute here. Um, and, and my background, um, I'm an engineer um, by background. Um, please don't hold that against me. Um, Specialising in environmental engineering, um, which is is probably one of the more sort of multidisciplinary sort of um, engineering um, things you could do, and that's sort of been a, a key um, sort of theme of, of a lot of the work that I've done um, since then. Is how do you kind of integrate technical stuff uh, with with a lot of the broader processes that are needed for um, generating change, and so. Um, I sort of started in environment and kind of moved um, more specialised in water and really into this sort of climate risk space and and really thinking, you know, how do we kind of um, drive increased recognition around climate risk and, and some of the challenges around that. And um, as an academic, um, trying to sort of take a research lens to that to really reflect on how do we do this, you know, what are the, some of the things that we could do differently. So that's, that's me in a nutshell. Thank you so much, Seth. Um, so moving on to the topic of our session, partnerships. Uh, for AWP, partnerships has for a long time been undefined, but <laughs> Sarah, unless you want to jump in. Um, but in my perspective, uh, partnerships for AWP are a formal way of collaborating to achieve outcomes where risks and benefits are shared at different levels. Um, as the Deputy Minister, the Assistant Secretary and the Governor said yesterday, AWP is a DFAT funded mechanism to provide water resource management support to the Indo-Pacific through partnerships. Um, we are grounded on our partnerships. They make us stronger. Our Australian partnerships enhance our skills and our abilities. Our international partners give us wider reach and our in-country partners give us that local knowledge and credibility. Um, so acknowledging that language matters and that definitions vary from organization to organization and individual from individual, I'll just invite uh, speakers to tell us what are partnerships to you and why are they important in your work? Um, Clem, do you want to start? Hello. Sorry, um, so yeah, for, for Ghana people here on this landscape, um, we are the minority or a minority on our own land. So, you know, with um, Australia being a multicultural society now, I think, um, you know, on average around Australia, you know, we take up between 2% and 3% of the population. Um, I think that's a little bit lower here on Ghana country. Uh, that means when we're talking about cultural issues, um, we need to partner. Mm -hmm. you know, we need to partner with many different organisations, individuals and um, groups, I guess, to uh, address some of those cultural concerns that we have. And quite often, you know, that is um, people approaching us, you know, to hear our perspective and um, 
to hear that kind of you know that Ghana view on on some of those cultural issues. Um, in the past, it hasn't been the best. If I'm completely honest, things are getting better, and I had some amazing conversations yesterday with a lot of people about how here in Australia, you know, things are a lot different to what they were 30 years ago. Um, we still sometimes experience, you know, when when partnering, sometimes it's a little bit one one sided though, you know. Um, we like we kind of mentioned or talked about yesterday. There is a bit of a clash of value systems between modern society and you know the Ghana way of life. Um, so in the past, you know, it's been hard to get our voice across, and quite often when we are engaged, it's quite often at a informing kind of level rather than you know really working together. But there has been a really big change in that regard. And I guess um, the example that I'm going to give is the work that we do with Wobbly Kamanka. And I guess um, for, for me, myself personally, I think Green Adelaide are taking a bit of a lead role here on Ghana country to ensure that uh, engagement with Ghana communities isn't tokenistic. So actually, you know, having ongoing conversations rather than just coming to a meeting, informing us about what's going on, you know, hearing what we what we think, but then walking away and just continuing down the path that you're going down in the first place. Uh, with Green Adelaide and Wobbly Kamanka, we've set up a, an advisory committee that, you know, it's a, it's a central location or a central point of call for various organisations to come and approach Ghana and hear our perspective. Um, through that process, with a lot of leaders involved in that group, we are able to I guess, you know, have the harder conversations and ensure that it isn't just a one-off. And um, we've achieved some really good outcomes in that regard and some pretty exciting things coming up. Uh, you know, things like the fire that was mentioned yesterday as well. So, yeah, exciting times, but uh, definitely, you know, we can't do it on our own. And as Ghana, you know, a lot of our elders have said for many years, we don't want to be walking this journey, you know, with cultural revival and trying to repair our landscape. We don't want to be walking this journey alone. We don't want to be walking in front of people. And we don't want to be walking behind people. So you know, Uncle Jeffrey New Church, he talks about a lot, you know, it's about walking side by side together to achieve, you know, the best outcomes for land, for country. Thank you so much, uh, Clem. It mustn't have been easy or it mustn't be easy to be a minority and it's very brave of you to open up and basically invite us to walk side by side you um even though it's a bit of an intentional partnership that you need to form but a bit forced as well uh Kinika, if you want to follow up just reaffirm that you're not minority when you sit here i also minority <laughs> so i would say that from oxfam and from our perspective we Partnership means to us, it's about the relation. It's not for us, it's very important. Do we have a relation at different level, whether the partner with the individual, sometimes the personal relationship, the partner from individual to the institution, somehow we look into achieve what we want, but we forget in terms of the process, how we build the relation, how we work together. Are we sharing the same vision? We're looking more on, we're sharing the same understanding. Are we have a mature understanding to work together? Like you said, we don't want to work in front. If you see the hiring, okay, partner at the community, you go ahead and then I go at the back. You know, it, it become how we can understand each other and we know each other that everyone have their own strength and also their own challenges. So we acknowledge that in the partnership, we're looking for more how we can help with each other and how we can support each other and also hold each other accountable. We look at two way of communication. Partner can hold Oxfam accountable and then we also can be accountable to overwork. We ask the question, we challenge over behavior, we challenge over power. We always looking not just only come with the funding and supporting to the partner, but we also conscious and ask our question, are we doing enough to transfer the power to those partner that we work with? We know that when we come with the money, we already have a privilege. We already have a power. 
Power is not balanced. Even though we said that we're balancing the power, but partner will look at us from the different way. So every time we have to conscious in terms of how we are going to the community and talking with the partner when we have a resource there. We already have that privilege. So we, we make sure that our privilege and our power are transferred and communicate well to our partner. And secondly, I would looking at somehow if you refer, I would I would put Dr. Anula into the spot again. He, uh, yesterday in his speech, in the context of the Mekong, the relationship partnership can be stronger, not just only the formal, like get into the sign agreement contract and then you receive fund and then we are partner and STEM. But it's a lot of things that go informally. How you care about the partner, how we, we just not reach out to AWP or AWP reach to the partner or Oxfam as the partner when you need something from them. But when you not need something from them, we don't have ever communicate with each other. So I think this is uh, uh, somehow it never make that partner become a trust. I would say like mutual understanding and trust each other. So for me, I think the more most important when we work in the partnership, the relationship and the communication and understanding and care with each other, it's the most important to build trust among us. And why it is important? We believe that everyone have their own expertise. We know that like you, you mentioned, the people have their own knowledge to share. And when it comes to the climate change, the community are the one who are the ground. Like, for our program, we work with fisher community, we work with fishery, uh, like forestry community. Those are the ones who are at the frontliner who protect those biodiversity ecosystem and the resource. We also contribute a lot to the climate change. So if they don't really contribute, if they don't take part in the activity that we implement, it will not make any change happen. Sometimes we know that academic have their strong knowledge in terms of how to bring the science to, to translate into the information. So we, we trust on the capacity and the knowledge that the academic have that could bring into you know, knowledge and action. So that how we bring the academic into uh, the work we are doing. So currently we are working with a diverse group in our project. We're working with the journalist network. We know that they are good in terms of how to communicate and transfer the message into the wider audience especially those we want to influence their thinking, what we want to know that this issue, not just at the local, but it can be brought up into the international. So we know the media play a very important role into that kind of messaging. And they are strong in terms of putting the story into a more simple and communicate that message well. We know that the government play a really important role how to make the policy uh, enabling to those community that we work with. So we rely Everyone have their role, and we also rely that everyone have their own challenges. So we accept. We don't have put too much expectation to the relationship, but we accept what we can do together to make the relationship better mm -hmm. and can achieve the common goal. Thank you, Thank you so much, Kinek. It's very important uh, what you have described in very detail. I hope everyone's taking notes. But yeah, it's critical to recognize that we are organizations partnering, but organizations that are made of, of individuals and we're all professionals, but also human beings. Um, I'll pass over to Alison um, to answer what are partnerships and why are they important in your work? Sure, um, thanks Lucy. Uh, maybe just to sort of set the scene a little bit. Um, from ADB Waterside, we work with a thousand plus water entities on the ground, ranging from water utilities, small poor shavas in Bangladesh to government agencies, um, large urban utilities, river basin organizations, and irrigation operators. So we work with a variety of, of water entities and partnerships are absolutely central to us to being able to deliver on our mission of um, promoting a resilient and water secure Asia Pacific. And so I think partnerships to us uh, mean a variety of things. We, we have different forms of partnerships. So for example, um, we have financing partnerships. This is where partners will provide financial resources to ADB, um, such as grant financing um, that allows us to pilot and trial innovations. It can be parallel financing for large infrastructure projects where ADB doesn't have the our own resources. So partners will come in and, and do parallel financing. We have knowledge partnerships, and this is where we partner with resource inst uh, research institutes, the university. Um, to really do um, 
try to do um, groundbreaking research and, and knowledge work um, to, to look into water uh, management issues in Asia and the Pacific and how we can best tackle those. We do capacity building partnerships, again, where we work with um, training providers to, to deliver capacity building activities to our water entities. We, we have implementation partnerships where, for example, we work with civil society organizations um, to deliver uh, sort of grassroots activities um, on the ground. So we, we work at all levels. And I think not forgetting as well for us, our clients are also our long-term partners as well. For example, in Bangladesh, um, we've been working with Dakawasa and we've been part of their journey for the past couple of decades as they've turned around from sort of a struggling water provider to one of the best performing utilities in, in the region. And similarly, Timor Leste, which since post since independence, we've been working with them to um, develop their water sector um, and move from a post-conflict situation to now and a situation where it's just created a new corporatized water utility and uh, a regulator for the sector. So that's quite exciting to be um, with our with our clients and on, on partnerships for the long run. Um, maybe also I'll, I'll mention, yeah, and also not to forget, I also want to acknowledge in our partnership with um, the Australian Water Partnership, just as an example of knowledge partnership activities. Um, the, the partnership with AWP has en enabled us to do groundbreaking work like our um, flagship Asia um, Water Development Outlook, which assesses the um, water security of all of our, the countries in Asia and the Pacific. That's been quite um, uh, enormous to support and this work. Um, and we, we did that with the International Water Center um, we've also been able to benefit uh, and have our water entities benefit from a training on climate change and digitization. And then as part of our newest um, partnership uh, platform, we just launched what's called the Asia Pacific Water Resilience Hub. Um, and this is a virtual hub where we're asked that's open to basically to anyone uh, with an interest in, uh, in water management, water resilience in Asia and the Pacific. It's where we've invited our water entities that we work with on the ground that I mentioned, as well as all sorts of partners to come and join. And we hope to create, we're creating a platform basically where we're providing tools, knowledge, uh, capacity building opportunities um, with the real intention that we want to build capacity of our water entities on the ground to build their water resilience. Because right now we see climate um, climate change and water resilience is being quite high level to many of our water entities. Our water entities know that climate change is here. They need to adapt. They need to build the resilience. But really, there's a real gap uh, in information and capacity on how to do that. And the Asia Pacific Water Resilience Hub is an attempt to sort of bridge that gap with part, working in hand, hand in hand with partners to deliver the, the, the information and tools and capacity to, so that they can really um, have have the resources they need to to make changes to to build their resilience in in anticipation of of climate change impact. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alison. I'll just do a follow up question because you mentioned that you have partnership with finance, research, knowledge, and I think a couple more. So why do you partner with so many organizations? Why not just do it in house in ADB? Simply, we wouldn't be able to. First of all, in terms of just having the people there, but also comparative advantage as well. So we, when it comes to uh, research partnerships, uh, for example, we we reach out to um, to universities that have the best possible knowledge in area. As I mentioned, we we um, have worked with the International Water Center in Australia. We're now working with the University of Technology in Sydney. Um, so this, we recognize the comparative advantage of other partners when we work with civil society organizations on the ground. We recognize that ADB, we, we're a large organization, and when we're doing grassroots activities, for example, which are really critical, we may not be the best ones to deliver, and so we partner with local NGOs. And, and sometimes it's a real, it's, it's very interesting, it's a real hand-holding exercise because we're building their capacity as well, but we recognize that that's really important to do. So I think, yeah, I've different, I've basically different partnerships for different purposes and, mm -hmm. and recognizing each of our, our strengths and really how when we can work together, we can achieve a lot. Thank you so much, Alison. Uh, over to Arun. Um, what are partnerships to you and why they're important in your work? Uh, thank you. 
No, I could repeat uh, what uh, previous speakers have already said. Um, now, uh, EC mode uh, is a relatively small organization, and uh, we operate only from Kathmandu, uh, but then our working area is spread over eight uh, countries, as I earlier. And our, uh, you know, professional strength, uh, you know, uh, you know, oscillates between 100 to 200 at some time. Uh, so it's a large mandate, uh, but a small, uh, you know, group of people uh, working on it. So it is very, very natural that we have a strong partnership. Uh, and then for us then to deliver, the relationship is very important. So uh, the ownership, co-creation, you know, uh, and as you have said, uh, Lucia sharing benefits and risk uh, along the journey is very, very important. Um, as an intergovernmental organization, uh, we normally, our you know, natural partners are government entities, but then to deliver, we cannot just uh, rely on government entities. We have to rely, we have to partner with multiple types of partners, you know, uh, from different sectors, ranging from government, to uh, private sector, non-governmental organizations, academia, and down to, you know, uh, even sometimes community-based organization, depending on the nature. So co-creation, you know, co-design is very important. Uh, our mandate involves uh, uh, strengthening, empowering our regional member countries and their people through interventions, uh, capacity building, knowledge generation, uh, but then for that interventions have to happen at all level, at community level, and right to the global level. So I think uh, that also tells uh, how what kind of partnership we have to be involved in. In my strategic group, which involves working in cryosphere, uh, DRR, river basin management, and air pollution, the topics are uh, also very, very diverse. So I think uh, that also tells the diverse kind of partnership we have to work uh, with. Our focus is mountain and mountain people and try to see how we can you know, help address the challenges, many different kinds of challenges, in environmental challenges, and the climate related challenges. You know, uh, that uh, you know, um, involves coming up with uh, understanding the challenges itself, but then not only that, uh, coming up with solutions, uh, um, testing solution, recommending and scaling out. So all that process uh, involves, you know, you know, partnering with different kinds of organization. Uh, we are not a truly research organization, but for this research becomes integral part of it. Uh, our research is very much applied solely solution oriented in nature. Uh, and for that, we have to also uh, partner quite a lot with uh, uh, ag academic and research organization. Uh, we work a quite a lot on synthesizing knowledge, you know, not just generating knowledge ourselves, but collating, compiling knowledge generated by uh, a regional organization as well as you know, the national organization and company up with uh, you know, assessment, for example, the Hindu Kush Himalaya assessment, which we produced in 2019 is a good example, which uh, included diverse areas, including climate, uh, water, cryosphere, uh, gender, adaptation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that is a very good example of how uh, we need to bring, uh, you know, researchers uh, from global uh, communities to work on work on uh, this area and highlight the changes happening, the rapid changing in uh, Hindu Kush Himalaya region, uh, and and need to work on it. So that probably gives you a flavor of the kind of partnership uh, we are involved in, and how why partnership is very much uh, uh, important for us, uh, and and the contribution that uh, partnership makes to us is the only way actually we can deliver. Otherwise, you know, as a I said in the beginning, as a small organization, it is simply not possible for us to do what we are doing today. 
I'll stop here, but uh, we'll talk more about uh, the approaches we take, you know, uh, and those kind of things uh, later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arun. I see some similarities between your approach and Alison's approach. Seems like when you're addressing situations from a holistic perspective, you simply can't cover everything. And perhaps I also see some potential for partnerships with Clem, BJ, and Arun based around air pollution. But I'll just go over to Ashley. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, so in terms of um, what partnerships mean to me, I, I guess partnerships are a way of engaging in good faith with colleagues, mm -hmm. friends, um, and and really they, they are a way where we can collaborate and work together in the ambiguity. And often there is ambiguity in how we work together across multiple organisations, but a partnering approach lets us find our way um, through that. And so I think when we, we I, I guess myself, I work in um, water resource management, long-term water security planning, um, all in the, I guess, the, the context of a changing climate. And, and these are really complex problems um, and they're complex systems. And I think we have to have the humility to recognize that there, we, we, it's impossible to understand every aspect of that system. And by partnering, we, we bring in that diversity of perspectives and by bringing in that diversity of perspectives, it means we build resilience and create robust long-term solutions. And so that's why I think the partnership approach is really important just to bring in that diversity of perspectives. Um, and so that the outputs and the outcomes can be co-owned uh, because there's nothing worse from my perspective than a government strategy that results in a strategy document that sits on a shelf. Um, a strategy document to be useful has to be owned by the people that will be impacted by it and unless you build that together through a partnership, um, I don't really see another way to achieve those type of outcomes. Thank you, Ashley. It's a very uh, big task that you have, especially with the focus on the long term. Um, I'll just go over to Seth before we run out of time. Yeah, um, so I was sort of thinking how to answer this question. And, and um, as an engineer and an academic, um, it's, it's an interesting thought experiment to think what happens if you don't partner? And um, not partnering from an engineering perspective usually means very technocratic ways of solving things that might be very, very clever or very, you know, have, have a lot of fancy sort of technical elements, but don't actually meet the needs of, of the people that you're actually designing for or are misaligned in some way. And certainly as an environmental engineer where you think about projects that fail for whatever reason, it's usually not from a technical reason that it fails. It's it's a you know what we sort of might call a non-technical you know reason, which involves people and people and partnerships. If we take the same idea to academia, um, the the worst of academia is often what what people perceive of as ivory tower research. You know, academics may be talking to other academics, but not actually. Um, translating or, or or generating benefit outside of. Of, of the academic institutions. Um, there's nothing wrong with academics working together, but ultimately um, as a researcher, we have no influence over, over the world other than through our ideas and, and so on. And I think it's really important to think about how, how that's a very much a two-way thing. So um, there's a lot of talk in universities about the sort of the linear model of translation. You come up with this really clever idea as an academic, and then you, you know, you try to, you publish it, then you you try to commercialize it and you get some end user to use it. And, and that just doesn't work um, most of the time. Most of the time it's it's a very organic, iterative, cyclical process that's that's kind of this continual learning. Um, and I've found that very powerful in my own um, career. So just as an example, um, I've been working in this climate space for uh, a couple of decades, and but I also work on, on projects um, it's a real world projects and and a decade ago we we're trying to incorporate all this information on future climate risk in projects and the information wasn't quite right for implementation and so we then started thinking about okay what's what's missing and and most projects fail because lots of things happening going wrong at the same time almost nothing fails because of one mode of failure you know if you think about some, a natural disaster or something like that it's always a lot more complex than it says in the books, in the textbooks. And so, you know, we started thinking, okay, there's this clustering and this, this kind of um, interesting behavior going on. And we, we labeled that compound events at the time. Um, and anyone who works in climate 
risk at the moment. We'll sort of see that word used a lot, but it wasn't used at all in those times. And so that came from actually working with end users. It wasn't. It didn't come from the academic world. It came from trying to apply academic concepts in the real world, realizing they weren't fit for purpose, and then working back to the research and working backwards from there. Um, so really sort of having that partnership approach to generate ideas, realize what's wrong with, I guess, you know, current ways of thinking, for example, in, in academic world and taking that back to the academic world has actually been the most powerful part of the partnership, not the other way around about trying to export research to, to outside. Partnerships, I think, but partnerships need to be fit for purpose as well. And so the work that we did with compound events started very much um, on, on very applied projects working with, with industry and with stakeholders. Um, but then trying to get that resonating um, around the world took work with academ academics, in, in actually. And so we partnered with, with very large global academic consortia of, you know, 60 plus academic institutions to sort of elevate that concept. And, and so that's then led to, you know, it being much more widely accepted as, as kind of part of the climate risk framing is that things come in clusters and, and that we need to deal with the complexity of climate is not just um, a very linear process. So that then sort of led to that academic partnering, which was very useful. But now what we're finding again is that it's still not actually fit for purpose most of the time. And so now it's really, again, about how do you do sort of what, what I sort of call context aware risk assessments so that you really understand what actually the local challenges are, the local problems, you know, water is is a very local you were just talking over lunch water is an incredibly local thing um one solution doesn't map very easily from one place to the next and so really understanding that context how do you do that well through partnerships and so it always comes back down to partnerships uh, thank you so much Seth. and while i have you speaking of uh how you need to partner to address the complexity of the issues could you give us an example um of when you've had to form a consortium how you've approached partners how do you go about it um so again every every um situation is is very different um and i think it's really worth thinking about what the value of the partnership is um mm -hmm. so not necessarily just going into a partnership because we need to collaborate but actually thinking about how does how does it all fit together you know what what do people bring um and but also letting that evolve so as you then you know you develop that understanding um so an example um where we didn't really go out to partnership it was actually with um with dw and others um in the barossa was um where we tried to develop uh, a water security strategy um for uh the barossa and it, and um, someone else sort of helped with the partnerships, but it was a real pleasure to be involved in that process and and sort of learn about, I guess, some of the challenges and some of the perceptions um, in, in, um, in that region and realize that all the tools that we we're planning to use were actually not quite fit for purpose, you know, and we had to be quite, you know, adaptive to, to, to that challenge. Um, but really, I think the key thing was to think about where the value sits um, just as an example, I guess there's, there's certain things that you do need technical expertise for. Um, there's certain things that you, you know, you need scientific processes about testing evidence and, and that sort of expertise. And so, um, whereas other processes that are sort of more normative, you know, about values, everyone is an expert, you know, because everyone has a set of values. And so it's, um, that that's, that's meaningful. And so it's, it's understanding how it fits together and, as a technical person myself, knowing the bounds of what's a technical conversation and what's a values-based conversation, which is often not very well understood, I think, by engineers, um, is when do you stretch stretch from a very, you know, I guess what we call a positive sort of techno type world to something that actually has values? And, and when do you bounce from one um, of those to the other, I think is a very important um, thing to make sure that we 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 stray in or we stay in, in, in the right places. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that's probably the key is, is, is to think about how that value is created across the partnership is, is core to sort of forming those, those teams, um, and recognizing that everyone has a role to play. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That, that was very comprehensive, although we're still waiting for that concrete example. Uh, we can reach out to Seth to learn more about the Barossa water security strategy. Uh, since while we're on values, I'll just go over to Clem. Um, Clem, I learned from uh, my colleague Sonia and from you that uh, climate change is not something that you consider as a thing because you see the changes in nature and that's what you see, the changes of water flows and changes of 
um, animals and the fisheries and so on and so forth. So in the context of everything now being about climate change, how do you integrate climates in the work that you do with communities and your work in education? So I, I actually, you know, I agree with a lot of the climate change sciences mm -hmm. currently. Um, you know, our climate is has been constantly changing for thousands of years, but it's you know obviously accelerated in the last couple of hundred. Um, for me, and you know, we talked about it yesterday. Uh, our old people live through climate change; they live through the last ice age, and you know, change before that as well. Um, for for me, I believe that um, climate change wouldn't be as much of an issue if there wasn't as much alteration to the landscape. So if we're looking at Ghana country specifically, and we talked about it yesterday with the clearance of land, um, you know, and having that kind of holistic outlook on nature as a whole, um, you know, taking away those big mother trees on the landscape was really damaging. You know, when we talk about you know, that canopy cover, providing that shade, you know, holding moisture in the soils, you know, the, the root structures, supporting the aquifer, things like that. Um, you know, our, our natural environment adapted to climate change in its own way when it wasn't so rapid. So for myself, again, you know, going back to the theme I talked about yesterday, the more that we can return the landscape to its natural state. Personally, myself, I believe that's one of the only hopes that we have, you know. Again, going back to the best example of sustainability in the world, our old people living on this landscape, you know, harmoniously for 60,000 years plus with minimal impact, is the best example in the world of sustainability. And if we can't learn something off of that, I don't, I don't hold much hope. Thank you, Clem. I, I hope you're uh, transmitting that hope to, to your educational programs. Um, and over to Kaneka. Uh, how, do you, how do you approach inclusion? How do you assure that inclusion is in the work that you do? And what advice could you give us? I, I would look at, uh, I think we value uh, everyone are different. So we know that we can agree to disagree. So even those we work in the partnership, but it, it, it doesn't mean that we have to agree in everything that we do. We respect on everyone have their own value. We ensure that we consist, like I mentioned earlier, in terms of uh, we transfer the power to the partner that we work with and we do the same partner also do the same with community. So we ensure that we put over sale as the duty of care. So over approach, we try to understand the risk. Like you mentioned that we share the risk, we share the benefit, but we are kind of looking at when it's come to the risk sharing. So which risk that partner can take? And there might be more risk compared to us if they are the local community, if they are addressing their own context and the issue, it's very sensitive. So we, we let them hear from them for them to analyze their own context and hearing from them what they want instead of coming with the partner with our own outcome, our own perspective in terms of what we want the partner to do. But we try to have more conversation and understanding and how we can make the project and design the work that can also help them to address or minimize the risk. And we know that when it's come to the risk, local partner, like local NGO, they may a bit hesitate compared to us as we are international, you know, because by the end we left the community, but they still there. So how we can ensure that they feel comfortable when we try to looking at how we can support them when, we, uh, when they need us. We also ensure in terms of partner with the different identity. Like I mentioned earlier, we're working with indigenous network in the region. We're working with indigenous network in the country and disability network in the country. We know that we don't expert on 
those working with disability, we may not be able to build trust for overnight. So we have to have to find someone out there that already have the relationship with their target group. So we acknowledge their value and we work with them and we build the understanding. And I would say that those kind of diversity that we bring will allow us to ensure the inclusive in our uh, project. And we continue to analyze and planning and also the resource. We always think about how we can resource because inclusion, it come up with the cost. So if we already acknowledge the issue, but we don't really put an extra resource and extra support into to address the challenge that the community and the partner face, it will be not achieve the inclusion. So that I, I would looking at from the policy, from the capacity that we have, not just only for the partner, but internally for uh, our team who are implementing the project to understand what does it mean for inclusion for us so that we can deliver what we said. And like we, 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 we always say that walk the talk. So if we talk something, we should that walk the same what we are committed. So those kind of the principle for us, it make inclusion uh, really uh, happen in the ground. Thank you, Kaneka. It sounds like you're not really reactive to partnerships, but you're very, as well, intentional and you involve potential partners in the co-design. Yes, thank you so much. Um, Ashley, yeah, go on. I would so that require time. So yes, if we trust for the partnership that we want to achieve, it will not be able to achieve the inclusion. So it requires time and the process that we need to put in place. Time and resources, money, I think I heard. Ashley? Yeah, great. So, I mean, in terms of how we work in partnership, um, it really depends um, on, on the nature of the challenge being addressed. So, um, you know, we, we as a state government have a great partnership with the AWP uh, and that continues to emerge and evolve. But we think we've got a really great story to tell. Uh, in our region more broadly around some of the experiences uh, in Australia and particularly in South Australia uh, that have been, you know, well, well learned over the last, well, originally through the millennium drought, but continued on. And there's been a lot of innovation since then that we continue to push, which we think are relevant more broadly uh, to the region. So we see benefits in partnering there, um, but there's also lots for us to learn. Um, and there's a lot for uh, uh, the members of our team that may be able to go and participate in projects and in, in our region and, and learn really about, you know, where we fit in the world. Sometimes we can be a bit insular as state governments, I think, but rising our um, heads above the parapet can be really important there. I guess more locally, um, we seek to partnership, particularly in the development of our water security strategies. Um, and, and as I talked about before, that really is because of the complexity of the work that we're engaging in there. Um, and what that looks like really is about giving as many people as possible a seat at the table and a diversity of voices at the table there so that we can really start to articulate a shared vision amongst a collection of our partners um, through the development of a strategy process. And by being really clear and being deliberative, um, and deliberate about what that shared vision is from a partnership perspective, really you build from a position of strength then, and then yes, there's trade-offs to be made. Yes, there's evaluations to be made through time around how you prioritize different actions, but you get those perspectives and voices in those um, conversations as well. Thank you, Ashley. And are there some unusual partnerships that you have formed in the later years, perhaps to transition to the so-called post-carbon economy? Well, they, they don't feel unusual, but um, I guess they, they may be different to, to what we might have thought about in the water sector previously. But um, when we're developing long-term strategies, we're, we're now bringing in people with expertise in agricultural technologies, with expertise particularly in mitigation and the energy sector. I think we're seeing so much more and more here in South Australia that as we um, progress to far, far higher levels of renewable energy, we have, you know, we had a period this summer where we had... Uh, I think it was over 10 days or 100% of the energy in the state um, was produced by renewable energy, which is quite remarkable on a global scale for an economy of our size. Um, but that brings up new conversations about water as well, uh, particularly in and around hydrogen. And so now we're having partnerships with people in the energy sector and looking at those interdependencies between water and energy in a way that um, probably I wouldn't have anticipated at the start of my career. 
Well, thank you so much, Ashley. Well, you heard it, everyone. Ashley is open to collaboration and partnerships, so reach out. Um, I'll go over to Allison. Allison, you were telling us about the ADB Water Resilience Hub, and what I got from that is that everyone can become a member and access resources. Are there any other way in which uh, people can partner up? Uh, thanks, Lucia, and great question. Yeah, for the, the Asia Pacific Water Resilience Hub, uh, yes, it's open to anyone who can join, um, who wants to join. So please do, I think if you Google the, the hub, it should come up and there's a link to register and you can access all sorts of resources or if you have resources to offer. Um, for example, if you have a great tool or knowledge resource, um, you can also offer that and we can also cross connect um, those those um, resources. So yes, please, if there's interest, do join. Um, but yeah, as mentioned, there's a variety of, of ways that, that we um, have partnerships. Um, maybe I one, one thing I want to pick up on from the speakers was just that um, the, the really the willingness and the goodwill and how that gets uh, partnerships really far. And that made me think of uh, the water a uh, long running program of ADBs, which is um, the water operator partnership program. We've just relaunched this and now focused it specifically on climate change resilience. But I think in water, everything gets back to quote, climate change resilience, like non revenue water, um, uh, energy efficiency, it all links back to climate change. And these twinning partnerships, um, for, from our perspective, we've worked with Australian utilities in the past who've been great. Um, the model works by us pairing a recipient utility, so a utility in the Asia, in Asia or the Pacific, which is struggling with a particular water management issue, and they're paired with a mentor utility. So it could be a utility from Australia or in even we have um, mentor utilities from Asia, um, from Europe, North America, and they're, they're, the two entities are twinned and they work on a specific problem. Like for example, non-revenue water, which I mentioned. And the, I think one of the reasons why these partnerships are so effective is because both the mentor and mentee utilities provide their time for free. And basically um, there's a meeting of minds between water operators and there's such goodwill to, to work together and solve problems and come up with solutions. So I, I wanted to highlight that as sort of an example of um, you know, where goodwill really works um, for effective partnerships on the ground. And we're hoping to continue the momentum um, with this by specifically focusing on resilience, as I mentioned. Um, so yeah, there's a variety of ways we're trying to extend and build on partnerships to really um, uh, address climate change in, in our region. Uh, thank you so much, Alison. That sounds really positive. Uh, may I ask, how do you evaluate the effectiveness of this twinning practice? That's a really good question. And we actually did an evaluation of, of the twinning partnerships uh, last year. And that that was sort of one of the challenges we faced um, is how, how to effectively evaluate um, putting partnerships. And I think more broadly, our partnerships in general, um, we look generally at um, what we set out to accomplish and whether that was accomplished. Um, that's not always easy if there's um, not a lot of baseline information, but also um, one of the things we grapple with with partnerships is you know how to, how to make the best use of these. Um, we admittedly, we sign a lot of MOUs uh, with all kinds of organizations um, and we don't always, that doesn't always um, end up being um, translated into action. Uh, I heard a really good quote recently saying we need um, fewer MOUs and more MODUs, which kind of gets <laughs> to the point is um, it's not always easy to work with uh, bureaucracies like ADB admittedly, and sometimes it is really hard work sort of jumping through the hoops to, to um, get these or, um, arrangements signed. Um, but for those who persevere, you know, they, they can be effective and we can accomplish quite a lot. And probably beyond what we otherwise would do kind of under our business as usual, I'm just thinking of sort of innovative examples. Um, uh, we recently worked, for example, with um, Monash University on uh, resilient and formal settlements using water sensitive design. And that is a great example of a knowledge partnership. It was kind of pioneering for us because um, from ADB side, we hadn't done too many of these partnerships, but it was a great way for us to um, 
to look at, you know, what are the what are some of the concepts that we want to pioneer and pilot and test. And being able to part with Monash in Indonesia and Fiji, I think, were the two countries that were chosen. We could really demonstrate how nature-based solutions can be used um, to support informal, informal settlement upgrading um, through these pilots. And that was incredible and something we probably would have struggled to do without this kind of partnership. So I guess getting back to your original question, Lucia, I think um, generally, yes, yeah, partnerships have many different facets that doesn't always make it easy to evaluate. But... Um, we generally tend to focus on on the outcomes and, and what we've achieved through those. Thanks. Thank you so much for that really comprehensive answer. And I will be looking at the work that you've been doing with our partners, what in certain CV cities. Um, Arun, you mentioned earlier that you have the mandate to partner with eight country part uh, eight member countries in the Himalayas. Would you mind telling us how how is Isimo's role in convening them and what are the challenges that you have? Um, yeah, um, as an intergovernmental organization, we, uh, you know, working in this region with eight member countries, uh, our uh, role in convening uh, in different areas is quite important. And I think that is also our mandate uh, there are many ways we do that. Uh, just to give you some example, uh, one way of doing it is facilitating collaboration and coordination in different areas. Uh, there are common challenges, common issues, uh, but then also common solutions, right? Uh, so bringing together those countries uh, to collaborate and coordinate is very important. So ECMOD brings together policymakers, researchers, practitioners, and other stakeholders to do uh, knowledge and experiences, uh, organize events, and enable partners to exchange, um, you know, ideas, um, information, data, if possible. Uh, it's a big challenge for sharing data in this region. Uh, and also, you know, uh, create environment for conducting joint research, uh, develop innovative solutions, right? So that is one way of uh, convening. Um, ECMOD uh, supports uh, several river basin networks in this region, in Hindukusha Himalaya region. Uh, some examples are Upper Indus Basin Network, uh, Kushi DRR, uh, knowledge of and also uh, part uh, participating in the Brahmaputra dialogue. Uh, so uh, these networks actually bring together, uh, you know, stakeholders from uh, different uh, disciplines uh, from the riparian countries to talk about uh, again um, common issues and solutions. So uh, that's another big area where we are working on. Then those issues could be around climate change, uh, DRR, uh, early warning system, sharing information, et cetera, right? Uh, there are various thematic uh, networks that we also support. One example is Cryosphere, but uh, there are others. Cryosphere um, Knowledge Hub is another example of convening researchers for sharing ideas, knowledge, solutions uh, around Cryosphere. Um, uh, earlier, I talked about, you know, the cycle of the work we do, you know, research, uh, uh, coming up with solution, uh, piloting, and, and scaling. Uh, for that, we need to do a lot of facilitation around policy dialogues and advocacy, and that's another area we heavily engage in, in different topical areas, bringing in uh, government uh, representatives, but not just government representatives, but uh, different uh, stakeholders to conduct what we call science policy dialogue so that, you know, uh, those solutions, those measures uh, can actually be uh, built into policies and practices which ensures large-scale scaling. So the, these are, uh, you know, few examples of the convening work we do. Um, uh, which is very important uh, for us. And uh, recently we have started this slogan, uh, Moving Mountain, uh, 
uh, which actually doesn't mean that we physically want to move the mountain. We want the mountains to stay there, stable, but we want to move the mountain agenda and bring it to uh, the center, in the center of uh, global uh, discussion. So for that also, we need to have a different kind of convening. And one area which, which we are very strongly working on is to bring the eight member countries to uh, work around what we had initiated as the, in 2020 as minister summit. Uh, and uh, to think, um, for example, like uh, Hindu Kusimalayan uh, council, uh, so that you know the challenges and, and solutions can be agreed and uh, in one voice, it can be brought to the global fora so that action at global level can be taken. Uh, so these are some of the examples of the meaning, uh, Lucia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arun, and for that joke as well. Very good. I'll just look to the room and uh, may I may I have an answer by a show of hands? How many of you work through partnerships, or how many of you are in a partnership, uh, work-wise? All right, almost everyone. And can you relate to the practices that our speakers have shared today? Is there anything else that you haven't heard and that you would like to share in terms of how you partner? Just give you a minute to reflect. Well, we would, oh, hello, yes. I'm just wondering if the panel members uh, ha have experience when they are having to work with an obligatory partner, but uh, there's difficulties in perhaps cultural differences or something like that, how you've managed to achieve your outcomes. Clem, do you want to get one? <laughs> um, I think I spoke to a couple of people about this yesterday, but one of, um, I guess, uh, an example um, that I could talk about is, uh, so through Wob Wobbly Kamunka, um, we were approached by the McLaren Vale Water Allocation Plan people, and uh, that was uh, about, you know, engaging us and trying to hear our um, perspective on how water, you know, the aquifer was managed in the McLaren Vale region, which is a wine region south of Adelaide here. Um, it's actually the area that I grew up in, so it's, I'm really passionate about that area. Um, within those meetings, and, and again, we're approached, you know, engaged to talk about our perspective, our oral histories, and um, in this particular meeting, I actually raised, um, you know, it's one of our oral histories talking about the Jill Brookie story that we we spoke about yesterday. Um, our oral history, so some of our elders talk about when they were younger, uh, the spring sites along our coastline don't flow as much. And there's a couple of different theories around that with, but, you know, all relate back to that alteration of land. Um, when we're talking about the McLaren Vale area, so the statistics say that 95% of the aquifer outtake is for vineyards in that area. Um, which, you know, for me and going back to, you know, that's, they're um, trees that aren't really meant to be growing on our landscape. You know, so when we're talking about agriculture on our landscape, you know, I think I mentioned yesterday, it's my opinion that with our, the amount of eco-biodiversity that we had in our landscape, there's probably an equivalent for every, uh, every food, every drink that, you know, that we're used to in modern society. And um, when we look at the benefits of native plants, you know, when we're talking about, you know, water usage and, and drought resilience, uh, our plants don't use water once they're established. You know, they're, they're made for this landscape. They've evolved on this landscape for thousands of years. And um, when you look at things like our native rices, grains, wheats, they grow in the middle of the desert. You know, so there's um, opportunity there, I think, to really rethink how we do things as a society. And again, you know, we look at some of those foods that have been genetically modified over 
you know, thousands of years like wheat, you know, they're not healthy for us. We could be going back to a healthier lifestyle, utilizing, you know, all the resources that are at our disposal in the landscape. But, you know, by wiping out the, you know, those big trees and, and um, creating these monocultures with no canopy cover is definitely contributing to climate change. But, um, but when we have voiced that opinion in, um, in certain settings, we are combated by scientific research. Um, in this particular instance, when we're talking about McLaren Vale, I talk, was talking about our canopy cover trees, our old mother trees, and how they supported the aquifer you know, from our belief system, you know, the fire supports the aquifer, talking about how, you know, those mother trees, the power that they hold and how they contribute to everything around them, you know, all the understory growth, but also the air above them, you know, and um, contributing to the atmosphere. And so our belief that, you know, the trees help to create the rain clouds, for example. But when I mentioned that to a hydrologist, I was told that that's not the case. You know, trees don't affect anything above them. And for me, <laughs> it just doesn't, didn't seem right. I don't see how that science could be accurate. Um, but again, we are the minority. You know, our beliefs are push, pushed to the side quite often. They're secondary. It's always seen in modern society, we put science on the pedestal. But when we look into you know, a lot of ancient knowledges, Again, we talked about it a lot yesterday. A lot of times the sciences are in just catching up. We'll probably have a lot to catch up, especially when we think about, you know, 60,000 minimum years plus of knowledge. Mentioned it yesterday to a few people. When we talk about modern day sciences, which might be, you know, a couple of thousand years old maximum, they've still got 58,000 years to catch up to the knowledge of our old people. And, you know, the more that you look into those intricate systems, that's what created that sustainability for those thousands of years, the intricate systems. And we talk you know, with people across the room, the similarities with indigenous cultures all over the world with First Nations people. And again, I just encourage people, if you can partner with First Nations people in your areas and in, in your regions, there's only going to be benefit for everyone. Thank you so much, Clem. And thank you for the invitation. I think, uh, a first-hand experience of what it is to be on country and to hear from you what country used to be like would make me build a bridge in those challenges and differences of values and opinions. Any other of our speakers want to address that question? And I'll just remind everyone that Menti is open in case you want to write your questions. Otherwise, I think we do have a mic, a microphone. Uh, but did anyone, before we go to the next question, want to address the Question, yeah, go ahead, Seth. Yes, there we go. A quick comment um, as, a, as a hydrologist. Um, but look, um, I think I think it exactly exemplifies why we need to partner because one thing, you know, science has learned a lot about different things, um, but there's also a lot it doesn't know. And um, what often happens in, in these processes, what I've observed is that you apply the sorts of models or techniques that happen to be available to a particular problem, regardless of what the problem is sometimes. And when you then really start thinking, okay, we, we really want to, you know, and, and a slightly different context to what you're saying, but in, in, um, in, in a different project, um, people say, well, what happens if we change our way that we manage the land? What's that going to mean for water systems? It's like, well, none of our models can tell us that with any accuracy. And so um, I, I think we, you know, as scientists, we do need to recognize that there, there is actually, there is value in the scientific process of hypothesis testing and so on, but there's also a lot of gaps in our knowledge. Um, and we, we have to be very careful how, how we, address some of those partnerships um, and recognize that there's a lot of stuff that we also are still learning about about um, about the world around us. Mm. Yes, of course, please. Maybe add, adding to that, uh, respond to the question, we, we need to understand what is the issue of partnership is 
which angle whether it's the issue and the problem could be compromised because in the partnership principle they also talk a lot about compliance about that principle those we're looking at from the angle which angle of issue that we have with uh, the relationship and the partnership that we are if it come to that the thing that cannot compromise i think that we, we go to the principle and always go back to what we have mentioned but when it comes to the way of working and relationship and i would say that working in the partnership yes it never on the honeymoon stage it will always have an issue along the way because it i like i mentioned earlier it the relationship matter so even though you work with the same organization but when the person change you have the different way of working again. So I think when it's come to the very critical issue, we always go back into how we agree on way of working, what can we uh, agree together, mutual understanding, but it's always like we can agree to disagree. Like at one point that we can compromise, we can go ahead to work together, but at one point that we cannot, we have to come into the decision and how we we want to be a partner together. We don't want to push and suffer that uh, partnership till the end, but that always have the discussion. Agreement cannot just fit for one year to the 10 year of agreement that always reflect and I would uh, say that we often have that annual reflection in terms of how we partner, how we work together, what we learn from our partnership, what is good, what is the failure, so that teach us how to do the better for the, the next, the rest of the year in our partnership. Thank you so much, Kanika. We'll go to a question um, by uh, one of our MRC colleagues. I, I don't have a question, but I just would like to share a view or my point of view is about partnership. I can bring into your consideration on Mekong River Commission. We established long term ago this story, more than 20. If we look on uh, 1997 up to 1995, uh, when we have 1995 Mekong Agreement established by four countries, Cambodia, Lao, Thai, Vietnam, and also support by of a development partner at that time. And we build strong partners. China, Myanmar, not uh, the members, but we call dialogue partner. And uh, supporter, donor, our partner, we call development partner. And countries, Cambodia, Lao, Thai, Vietnam, we are also partner because the, the partner, we build trust. We have 1995 agreement. We have policy strategy. We have strategic plan. We have best in development strategy and so on. So I think this is a very strong partner among uh, countries, among interested uh, partner like donor, because we have the, the same objective to uh, sustain, to, to support sustainable development of the Mekong. River Basin, and also we talk with China, Myanmar, also with the purpose sustainable and cooperation. And we contribute uh, the budget. We rely on the budget on fund from the development partner, but also from the countries. So it is like a spiritual partner. What I I understand spiritual partner, but we only miss that we don't have enough. A private sector involved with the Mekong River Commission yet, but we hope that for future, because we develop hydropower development, any water infrastructure, we will engage them. Example like the Mekong Fund, we are going to have this one also, we engage a private partner also. So from my point of view, we do a lot in order to trust each other, and then we contribute and we work together to achieve the common like MRC, we have reason, we have a clear mission, but miss one, one, uh, one gap, our partner should be bottom up also, not just uh, to top, uh, top down, top down from government, but not to agency, but not bottom up from the people, local communities or different civil society, not yet. So this is gap, what I, I said. We have to improve our partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing. It's definitely a great example of cooperation that has stood the test of time. And when you said that you wanted to engage the private sector, do you mean in the Mekong region or Australians as well? Uh, I talk about Mekong, but even here I learned that you have private sector also, but Mekong we still get not the uh, private sector, but in the country we have PPP public-private uh, partnership, but how to build in the MRC, 
not yet. Yeah, I still for future. Yeah. Thank you so much. We have a couple of questions, but the, the font is quite small, so I'll just try to make it larger. So we have a comment. Healing comes from respect and listening. Um, healing relationships takes work, respect, honesty, vulnerability, but importantly, time. The value of going deeper into the topic to identify some practical suggestions on what could improve things in the future. Oh, wait, this is from the previous session. <sighs> okay, here we are. When we're talking about partnerships, how was... <laughs> How would partnership ensuring the sustainability approach for the end beneficiaries in a way that the partnership outcomes are not only project driven, but long term? Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump to Alison on that one. Yeah, that's actually a great question, because that's one of the dilemmas we face is with many cases when the partnership ends and if, if there's a financing flow, then the, the you know, an activity ends essentially and um it's the the partnership which um keeps things going and so um in many cases sort of we see as uh partnership is kind of a stepping stone to um a, a, an end game and maybe just to give an example um i guess getting back to our water operators partnership i mean one of the areas that we've focused on for example is um financial sustainability and helping utilities to uh, update their financial systems, um, do tariff reviews um, so with the original intention that um, once the partnership ends, that if a utility is able to effectively implement an activity, say on financial sustainability, for example, that once that ends and we build that capacity, then the entity should be sort of self-sustaining um, although it is it is a big challenge, um, the sustainability, and we do realize you know thing, things take take time. Um, just to give an example, with our our projects, for example, in in the in the past, sort of our investment projects were just five years. That was the standard time it took to sort of maybe develop the infrastructure, like build a water supply system, a water treatment plant, and after that, it was expected that the um, utility would take over operations upon commissioning. And would run from there. I think we've realized through um, probably some some painful lessons learned in evaluations that that's not the case, and that capacity building takes longer than five years. It takes it takes a lot of time. So increasingly, we've um, extended our project implementation uh, time period to include an operations and maintenance time frame as well to enable um, that time for capacity to ensure sustainability of of our activities. Thank you so much, Alison. I think that's one of the topics that came out in the engaging in important conversations as well. How do we balance having a limited time project and the long-term outcomes that we want to achieve? There's a couple of more questions around how do you enter a partnership when there is a predefined scope and a predefined framework? I think Kaneka already spoke a bit about that and about not coming from with a preset or pre-designed, but engaging in that initial from the start. Uh, another question, how does your partnership with Indigenous, local and First Nation community translate into your reporting of the shared knowledge? How does your partnership with Indigenous, local and First Nation community translate into reporting of shared knowledge? I'm not sure I understand that question, um, but I would like to think that at AWP we are working on ethical guidelines. Um, to make sure that any engagement, any information that we receive from our indigenous colleagues is treated with respect and um, and they are in control of what happens to that information. I'm just really aware of time. So I'll go to our speakers to do a final round of reflections and final message. Let's start with Clem. I guess, um, I think um, after the last day or two, I think I'm probably preaching to the choir with a lot of um, what I've said. Yeah. And um, when we're talking about partnerships and giving the example um, that I gave before, um, you know, there are a lot of positives that are happening with partnerships. And like I said, so with, for us, um, Wobbly Kamanka being the environmental focus Ghana advisory group, 
um, that has kind of provided that platform to address some of those concerns when it does, when we do have things that we might see as tokenistic. But, you know, being here in this room the last couple of days has given me a lot of hope. You know, I think um, a lot of people have this in the, you know, working with Indigenous nations and looking into old knowledges is at the forefront of a lot of people's thinking, which is exciting for me. And, um, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm thankful for everyone in the room for, for doing that. And I guess, um, you know, with what I've kind of previously said, I just, um, you know, like to kind of emphasise, you know, it sounds like everybody's already doing it, but the more that we can um, engage, and, you know, we've talked about it, it's, more, it's about that relationship building, and the more that we can engage in an untokenistic way um, and really take on board and listen to each other, I think that's when, where we're going to really move forward together. So, Natalia, everyone, thank you. Mania. Thank you so much, um, Clem. Yeah. I, I would say, like, for me, I always uh, positive, even though we still have a challenge to work together as a partner. But I think over the last uh, two days, we can hear a lot. Actually, we also aim the same thing. We have a really common vision that we want to achieve. We hear from the government uh, talking about how the, the policy it really addressed the climate change. We hear from our uh, friend from the community in terms of how we really want to work as a partnership. And for me, I, I feel like this is the new uh, open space for us to talk about this frankly. Like we put that issue into the table and we ask in terms of how we work together as a partner, how everyone can bring their own expertise into the room. We hear from the government, we hear from that academic. For me, it gives hope. So it 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 allows us to build the roadmap from not just waiting until the 2050 as the commitment from the COP27, but we can do it, start to do it from now to take an action on the climate change. And I, I believe that by putting the different puzzle and everyone cooking their own cake and put it into the table and put their own decoration in how we want the cake to look like. So I think that 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 help us to 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 move faster. We don't need to wait until the 2050 to achieve the climate change or the net zero. That's how I I feel optimistic about this. Wonderful. Thank you. Go ahead. Great. I, th I think from my perspective, um, if you're beginning on a partnership journey or, or really about um, starting a new project or strategy, it's really, really important to invest that time up front in understanding context uh, and really um, contextualizing any work that you're doing there. Um, and then really putting putting the work into the governance. We found that when, when, when there isn't good governance around a process or a project, that's where it's far more likely to fall over. Um, but the flip side to that is as well, like we don't want to stifle creativity and innovation. So, so we do need to build into these processes that they need governance, yes, but they need space for creative creativity, partnership, and innovation. Uh, and that's that's the balancing act from my perspective around how we need to work on on overcoming these really big um, and important challenges. Mm, thank you. More MOUs for two MOU. And this is going to get harder as 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 all the all um all these ideas um really reflect a lot of my thinking as well. Um, look, I think I think um I mean this session is partnership for climate action and and of course mitigating climate change, um, adapting to climate change. I mean these are very wicked problems. Um, there are no solutions without partnerships, um, and um, we need to take the time. It's it can't be a transactional you know. Thing. I think we've already heard that partnerships do take time and that can be really hard when you've got tight deadlines and project budgets and all these other things to really do take the time to learn about, you know, what the context is and so on. So it's, I think for me, it's, you know, really making sure that this is something that gets prioritized because it sounds great in principle, but it also can easily fall off um, the agenda when, when um, it comes to working in, in projects. Thank you so much. Sir. Over to Arun. Um, I would like to uh, go back to uh, the question from audience earlier. Oh, sorry, you know, Arun. There was, uh, no, that's okay. Just because it's just relevant to my last uh, intervention. Uh, I think what I understood is uh, there might be some mandatory partners, right? And if uh, 
there are issues with those uh, partners. How do you deal with that? I think that's a very you know <laughs> tricky situation. And for uh, organizations like AC Mode, um, intergovernmental organization, uh, and we are mandated with uh, to work with certain uh, partners. Uh, we cannot avoid them, and those are our focal. Uh, agencies, focal, focal organization in our regional member countries. Uh, so they are designated and we, we cannot, uh, you know, avoid them. Uh, and if they are not agreeing to our agenda, I think that, that would be a very, very tricky situation. Um, so, but then we, we haven't had that situation because we have been able to address that uh, making it not supply-driven thing, it is demand-driven. So all parties actually, actually agree that something being planned, proposed, is actually relevant for the region, for the countries. It's not just because a party is interested to do or wants to do. It's often the case, you know, in, in particularly research uh, situation. And uh, going through, you know, a heavy consultative kind of uh, process is very important. And that's what we do. You know, we plan for several years ahead um, and then go through consultative process and come up with, uh, you know, plan for, let's say, four or five years. Uh, and that avoids, uh, you know, complications. Uh, clarity on objectives, I think, and core values are very important for uh, Partnership. I think they, this looks very theoretical, but actually it is very, very essential when you are getting into partnership. And if you do not agree to the objectives, if you do not agree to the core values, I think uh, then I think we need to think of a different partnership. I think you cannot really force partnership. Uh, if you force partnership, I think that is that is a preparation for failure. And we have to be ready that, you know, this partnership probably will not work. Let's look at other, uh, you know, possibilities. I think that that is something which we absolutely have to do that. Otherwise, I think that's a preparation for failure. Uh, and these are some of the things which we try to do. Uh, I don't claim that we have been mastered, uh, mastering those, but uh, in uh, all aspects, we we try to stick to those points, and we have reasonable success, and that's what I would like to also recommend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you very much. much, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Arun. You're so right. Without that common purpose, it would be hard to even evaluate the outcomes through the same lens. And Alison, last but not least, please your final reflection. <laughs> thank you. I'll make it quick because I know we're over time, but not to not to be cliche, but I think the saying is really true that, you know, if you want to walk fast, walk alone. If you want to walk far, walk together. And I think that's absolutely true, particularly in the context of, of climate change, where we face increase, increasingly complex risks. Um, working together through partnerships is not always easy and takes a lot of work, sometimes like a marriage. Um, but if you can make it work and the partnership is, is well fit for purpose, then you can really do some, some really innovative things. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alison. And thank you to all of our speakers and to everyone who has stayed so far. And I think we're, it's time for afternoon tea. I'll hand over to Amerlin. Thank you so much. Thank you to all our speakers. So afternoon tea is served. If we can please be back at three o'clock for our keynote which we're going to the Pacific and we're going to be hearing from um, Ms. Rhonda Robinson, Director for Geoscience, Energy and Maritime Division at the Pacific Community. See you shortly. Thank you.